Hi, welcome to Hometown Church. I am Pastor Spencer Bernard, and look who I have here with me. <laughs> this is Pastor Mark Bowen, and you are from our Lakeville campus. I am. And you are doing the message today? I am doing that. And you have an easy topic, I hope. Well, it is racism. Not the easiest, but awfully relevant. Mm. What was the hardest part about this message? You know, I was a little timid. I struggled a little bit with, ah, what kind of criticism will I get for doing this? Because it's such a hot topic. I'm not sure it's possible to do it without ruffling some feathers. Mm -hmm. But I actually love putting it together. I think the Lord really helped me. And I hope you enjoy on the receiving end as much I enjoyed, as much as I enjoyed putting it together for you. Well, we can look forward to hearing that. And also, we have part three of our drama series with Corey and Kirsten. And I have seen this, and it's a pretty powerful and encouraging ending. So make sure you stay tuned for that. You're in the right place. So uh, how about praying? Beautiful. And then we'll begin. Lord, thank you so much uh, for today. Thanks for the privilege of worshiping you, for being able to be a part of this church community. And thank you, Lord, for your awesome love for us. Would you please just move us a little bit in the direction of getting a greater sense on our heart of the value you place on every man, woman, and child made in your image without regard to race. Please feed us. Please heal us. Please grow us. Help us move toward you. Amen. Amen. together strange as neighbors our blood is one children of generations of every nation of kingdom come so don't let your heart be troubled Hold your head up, I don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you So take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our help comes from Jesus, 
swing wide Oh, you heavens Let the praise go up as the walls come down All creation Everything with breath repeat the sound All his children Clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God His name is Jesus Sing it out, swing wide Swing wide All you heavens Let the praise go up as the walls come down All creation Everything with breath repeat the sound All his children Clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God His name is Jesus Swing wide Swing wide All you heavens
Nothing is impossible for you. We still believe you're moving. And you said that you would build your church upon this rock and not even the gates of hell would overcome it. Lord, nothing can separate us from you and nothing can divide us as long as we trust in you. We praise you for that, Lord. steadfast, never failing, you are faithful. All creation is in awe of who you are. You're the healer of the sick and the broken. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and our Savior forever. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done.
come against No one can stand between us God with us God for us Nothing can come against No one can stand between us Priorities. Blue lives matter. Black lives matter. You need to put on a mask. We need to open doors. Socialists. Fascists. People, people like, like you are the problem. problem. Well, I'm sorry, but we just, we had to go our separate ways. We may be weaker apart, but at least I know I'm on the right side of the issues. Message from the King of Kings. Information from the head man himself? Our real leaders is just what we needed. A game plan for these unprecedented times. New marching orders for here and now. That's nothing new. You are a chosen people made up of men and women, blacks and whites, zealots and tax collectors. Be very careful then how you live. Do not live like the Gentiles. Do not live like your neighbors. Don't live like your friends. Don't live like Democrats. Don't live like Republicans. Don't live like the right. Don't live like the left. Live like Christ. Live like Christ. Be very careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Follow God's example and walk in the way of love. Not the ways of cleverness or cuteness, not snarkiness, sarcasm, or snideness, in love. Don't let any unwholesome words come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Be quick to listen and slow to comment. Don't sell your soul for a like and a share. Do not be deceived, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood, or a people, or a party, or an ideology, or a group, or a mob, or a type. Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give the devil a foothold. Our fight is not one online, not at your get together. It's not one in the voting booth. Not in the polls, not in the media, and not in your rant. The fight is done on your knees. The fight in your heart. Finally, I pray that all of you may be one, so that the world may believe. So that the world may believe. Every day the world grows further apart. Every issue creating more and more conflict. Every new piece of information destroying the unity in our community. How do we prevent a fractured country from fracturing us? How can we stop ourselves from becoming divided? Thanks for joining us today as we wrap up our series of messages, Divided, Preventing a Divided Culture from Dividing Us. In week number one, Brent talked about how the tendency to choose sides and how to deal with that pressure. Week number two, Kit talked about what is your greatest source of identity so that a particular issue doesn't get too big and be the place where you derive the sense of self that you really do need. Last week, Spencer talked about how to handle it when Christians disagree, and he exposed us to excellent content from Romans 14 that's really practical. Today, we're going to go where angels fear to tread. We're going to talk about racism, when racism divides community. 
And we'll be looking at Moses in Numbers chapter 12. And I know this is a hot topic. And I would appeal to you uh, to listen carefully and be open to the possibility that there's some important learning for us on this subject. There has been for me. Before we jump into that content, let's do a little experiment, a thought experiment, with regard to drawing conclusions based on appearance. And for this experiment, we're going to use Rob Bussey's great-grandpa, who Rob affectionately refers to as Papa Joe. <laughs> Papa Joe was an Arctic explorer, and he had some unique traits, didn't he? And based on this appearance, my conclusion, and I said it to Rob, was, oh, boy, he must have been a really tough old bird. And Rob said, no, Papa Joe, he was very kind. He was actually, he was a softie. Used to bounce me on, me on his knee and sing me nursery rhymes. And, okay, so I made that all up. That was fake news, but I did get your attention, didn't I? This isn't Rob Bussey's. Papa Joe. But judging by appearance gets us into trouble. And the next image is real news. It is not fake news at all. This is my daughter, Joanna, and her soon-to-be fiancé, Vic. I love them both. And over the course of the last six months, I've been learning from Vic some things I really needed to learn. Uh, Vic works at a hospital in the metro area. He's going to nursing school and works in the hospital as a nursing assistant. Would you believe, I could hardly believe it, but I do now, two, three, four times a month, Vic is disparaged by patients who use the N-word to describe him. I was shocked. Three, four times a month, he said it's getting worse, not better. And he's really a good worker. And he's got a great attitude. He's got really good people skills. He's got high character. And yet, because of his chocolate-colored skin, there are patients that refer to him using the N-word routinely. And what does that feel like for him? I asked him. And he said, oh, it really hurts. I feel totally disrespected. I feel like I'm being treated like a dog. And he said on days that are really tough, when I'm stretched thin between work and school and a little sleep deprived, it's tough to fight the anger. And sometimes I feel despair. You know, this is Minnesota. This is 2020. This isn't 50 years ago in the deep south below the Mason-Dixon line. To learn to have greater empathy for my friends of color and what they have felt with regard to racial prejudice, I've had to listen to stories. And I've been asking for stories like I never have before. And it's really helping me. Perhaps it'll be a help to you. Let's define racism for a moment before we jump into our content. Racism could be looked at through the lens of self-justification. That is to say, a sinful way, a sinful attempt to try to feel superior, more acceptable, and better than others based on racial characteristics. Now, how do we know that that's a sin? Well, we do know it because it's a sin to violate in our thoughts, our actions, or our words the divine truth that all persons, all human beings, have equal dignity and worth because we're all created in the image of God. That goes right back to Genesis 1, the very start of the Bible. And we know that racist behavior, prejudice, Jesus is not in favor of that at all. When he was asked to define what is love of neighbor, after he said, this is the second greatest commandment, he gave the story of the Good Samaritan, didn't he? Depicting someone who at great risk and sacrifice meets the physical and material needs of a man of a different race, even of a different religion. 
And then he said, go thou and do likewise. That's Luke chapter 10. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that we must treat people of other races, nationalities, classes, and groups actually with the same amount of care, respect, and love that we would give to ourselves or to members of our own communities. So let's look at our topic for this morning, for today. How should we respond when racism divides community? And I'm going to start with a sermon and a sentence. A God-centered response, that's what we're after, to the sin of racism is empathetic, humble, and boldly just. Those are three things we're going to unpack today in the story of Moses in Numbers 12 when he encounters blatant racism. So Numbers 12, verse 1. While they were in Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. Miriam and Aaron are Moses' sister and brother. And they have joined him in his leadership task in leading Israel to the promised land out of slavery in Egypt. And they criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. So Moses is actually on the receiving end of blatant racism from family members, from leaders who should have known better, from people who did know better, but fell into a place that they didn't they didn't need to stay there at all, and that becomes clear as we read the story. How do we know this was blatant racism? Because Cushite is Ethiopian. That's what that word means. The Cushites were a tribe in the south of Ethiopia known for jet black skin. And Moses married a Cushite woman with jet black skin. She was a black African. Egypt, where Israel had been for a long, long time, is in the north of Africa. They're not totally jet black, typically. Egyptians, that is. They're more like bronze. So the Ethiopian, the Cushite lady, stood out. And what about Miriam? And what about Aaron? Well, they're Middle Eastern, so they're not Caucasian. They've got olive skin, probably. Darker than Northern Europeans, certainly. And they evidence racial prejudice. And that can be overt or covert. How do they do it? Well, they choose covert. Verse 2 of Numbers 12, they said, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? But the Lord heard them. Oh, this is really interesting. Sometimes, perhaps most times, Racism is camouflaged behind other objections. And God knows when it is. And I think there's a caution for us to hold on to. We don't know when racism is behind disagreement or objection or even criticism between a person from one ethnic group and another ethnic group or between people in the same group. We don't know. God does. And this is a balance issue. Part of what we need to be careful about is don't assign racism to every disagreement between people of different ethnicity or culture. That's a mistake, too. It's naive to think it's never there. And it's not wise to think that's always at the root. Neither one is wise. God is the one who knows. The next verse tells us something that's kind of incredible. It's a parenthetical statement about Moses. It says, now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. Wow, that's an incredible statement. And it's placed right in the middle of this passage where he's dealing personally with blatant racism, prejudice, that is harming community right then and there. This is a theme that is interesting in how Jesus addresses it. 
The theme of humility was addressed by Jesus in the Beatitudes, and he said it this way. God blesses those who are gentle and lowly, for the whole earth will belong to them. Those words, gentle and lonely, they are the English translation of a Greek word that means meek or humble. Meek. This is really interesting. The first beatitude was God blesses those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, that one's kind of easier to define than meek. Poor in spirit means you're in touch with the fact that you really need God. You recognize you've got some moral bankruptcy you can't fix. Another way of saying poor in spirit is in touch enough with my own depravity that I embrace God as my Savior. That's why in Blessed Are Those Who Are Poor in Spirit, Theirs is the Kingdom of Heaven, Jesus actually connects wise self-awareness with regard to personal weakness and depravity and moral bankruptcy with being open to the gospel. But the third beatitude, blessed are the meek, for the whole earth is going to belong to them? Well, that's harder to define. Meek, what is it? Well, it's not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. And meek is a word that is only used to describe two people in the whole Bible, Jesus and Moses. Jesus in Matthew 11 used it to describe himself when he said, come, all, come on to me all who are weary and heavy laden for I'll give you rest because I'm gentle and humble of heart. He's actually using the Greek word meek right there. What does that mean? A meek person is open and approachable. That's what Jesus was saying is true of himself. And I think it was true of Moses because he was meek as well. A meek person is gentle when provoked. And Moses wasn't born meek. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I, my personality, I, I'm more like a steamroller. Well, Moses actually was like that too by personality. But he, came, he gained the character of meekness over time you know, when he first stepped out to try to help his fellow Israelites, how did he do it? He did it by murdering an Egyptian who was mistreating an Israelite. That wasn't meek. That was not gentleness under provocation. Moses grew in meekness, and we can too. That's the point. And meekness is also bold in the face of evil. Moses actually grew to become both meek and bold. We won't look at the instances, but there's many of them that demonstrate that he was bold in the face of evil and took steps to address injustice courageously, boldly, and yet most of the time with a gentleness, a meekness, a humility that made the effect far better than when he killed the Egyptian and had to run for his life. So what is meekness really? And this is important. It's strength under control. It is not, this is a weak person, and I don't want to be meek. No, meekness is strength under control. That Greek word, meek, it was used to describe horses that had been broken so they could be ridden. Think of it. A horse that's been broken. Is it now a weak horse? Not at all. It's just as strong as ever, but its strength is under the control of the rider. It's submitting its strength to the best interest of someone else. That's what a meek person does. They submit their strength to the best interests of God and others. That's why Jesus used it to describe himself, and that's why God used it to describe Moses, perhaps the greatest leader in the entire Old Testament one of the greatest leaders in all of human history. So we parked there for a little bit because humility is really key in diffusing racial tensions. It's huge. It's so key. And Moses, in this passage, as we go through it, you'll see he's really humble 
and it helps to diffuse this incredibly intense situation. Moses doesn't fight back. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't seek revenge. He doesn't argue. He doesn't complain, even though he's on the receiving end of blatant racism. How can you possibly do that? He was meek. He had humbly submitted his considerable personal strengths to the best interests of God and others. That is key to diffusing racial tensions. What Moses did is he kept silent and he let the Lord take up his cause. I think he's quiet in this situation of injustice, whereas he spoke up in others because this one was aimed at him and speaking up just would have looked defensive. At least at this point, he waits for God. He actually only opened his mouth to pray for his sister. We'll see that in a little bit. So what do we learn here? Actually, humility in the face of injustice is a journey. It's an important journey. It's an uphill climb. Humility in the face of injustice is a journey from self-righteous to righteously self-aware. I want to gently suggest that when Moses killed the Egyptian 40-some years earlier than this chapter in Numbers, he was not only angry at the injustice he saw, but felt some superiority that led him to act out and actually commit murder and feel justified doing it. Would you think about this? It's kind of counterintuitive. I think humility in the face of injustice is very difficult because it is a journey from self-righteous to righteously self-aware, to be gentle, approachable, open, and yet bold difficult thing. So let's take up the passage again, verse 4. Immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and said, go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle, Aaron and Miriam, he called, and they stepped forward. And the Lord said to them, next slide, please. Now listen to what I say about my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I trust. Wow, what a lovely, lovely thing to have said about you. God went on, I speak with him face to face, clearly, and not in riddles, He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant, Moses? There's a very important lesson in these verses, and it could be summarized this way. God attaches great importance to our character, not to our race, not to the color of our skin not to whether it's chocolate or jet black or caramel or olive or white like mine. Oh, no, he attaches great importance to our character, and he wants us to do what he does. He wants us to be like him. And that's why God trusts Moses, because Moses is becoming like God. (laughs) He's got a great relationship with God. He's the most humble man on earth. He's really submitted himself, his considerable strengths, to God's agenda and to the best interest of others. This is a beautiful thing, that God attaches such importance to character, not race. You know why? Because it levels the playing field. And it's such a comfort to know this when people don't do this, when they lump us in with a group without knowing our character and maybe have some prejudice against us, and there's plenty of that going on these days, well, it's comforting to know the ultimate judge doesn't do that. The next verse, verse 9, says this, The Lord was very angry with them, meaning Aaron and Miriam, and he departed. As the cloud moved from above the tabernacle, 
There stood Miriam, her skin as white as snow from leprosy. Wow. What does that tell us? It tells us this. Racism offends God. Oh, yes, it does. He takes it very seriously. When we disparage people that he made in his image, who should receive the same dignity and be treated with the same worth and value as we ourselves would like to be treated with, he's offended when we do that on the basis of different race, ethnicity, nationality, or group. That offends God. Miriam is now white as snow from leprosy. It's as if God said to her, or would have said to her, Miriam, Moses' wife is black, and you think that's, that makes her less valuable than you. You think white is better. Okay, fine. You're going to be white as snow, not olive anymore. And your idolatrous attachment to skin color, I'm going to give you leprosy to show you that that idolatrous attachment to skin color is a disease as bad as leprosy. Wow. God judges the sin of racial prejudice because it really offends him. The next verse says this. When Aaron saw what had happened to her, he cried out to Moses, please don't punish us for this sin we've so foolishly committed. You know what's going on right here? I think it's this. Justice is key to diffusing racial tension because there's been some justice done by God to Miriam and it's gotten Aaron's attention. Yeah, justice is key to diffusing racial tensions. And maybe you're wondering right now, quietly thinking to yourself, well, okay, I believe that, but what can I do about justice? How can I bring about justice when there's racial tensions that are born of injustice? Can I suggest you and I can act and speak and think justly? We can make the same journey that Moses made. We can grow in humility. We can grow in empathy. And we can call out injustice. And we can work for justice. Yes, there are things we can do. And I think we should do all of them. And we can be comforted as well. Despite our limitations, ultimate justice is coming. At the end of history, God has promised a new creation. He's promised a material world wiped clean of all injustice, all prejudice, all death, all suffering, all tears, all war, all sin, all shame. Yes, ultimate justice is coming. Often in this life, in this fallen world, justice is not done. But we can help, and ultimately, God is going to fix that broken picture. Can I suggest a four-way test if you have the opportunity and feel led to confront injustice? There's a four-way test, and I've learned to use this with myself, not just the way I should have, but I'm learning. Um, whenever I need to confront somebody or some situation, where something's off and I think I ought to call out whatever is missing or unjust. A four-way test, is it true? What am I getting at there? Ask the question, if I think there's injustice here, could it be bias confirmation? Or even some fake news, do I have all the information? Am I really seeing things as they really are? I think that's important. These are slow down questions before you confront or try to call out injustice. Secondly, am I tender? Am I tender or am I angry? Boy, when you're angry, that is not the time to call out injustice. That just makes things worse. That just ratchets up the tension 
Am I tender? Because if I'm angry, if I'm not tender, there just might be some superiority under that that I need to work on. Or maybe some historic wounds of my own that I need to work on. Am I tender? Thirdly, is it time? What? What's that about? Well, have some empathy. Even if there's true injustice going on, maybe you need to consider whether speaking up and calling out someone else's injustice is not really timely because based on whatever else is going on in their life, you might be aware they don't really have the emotional margin. Maybe they don't have the maturity. Maybe they don't have even the time to address this realistically now. Jesus did something incredible in John 16. He said to his disciples, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. This is right before he went to the cross. He said, I got much more to say to you. And it had to do with all sorts of things they needed to hear. But more than you can now bear, it wasn't the time. You know what the Gospel of John records? Jesus didn't say anything else to them. He trusted the Holy Spirit to say to them what he could have, but they couldn't receive at that time. That's an important question. Is it time? Lastly, will it build trust? You know, a simple question. May I speak to you about something that I think is off? May I have your permission? And if they say yes, going forward builds trust. If they say no, trust the Holy Spirit to lead them where they need to go because they're not ready to follow you. Our last verse in this passage is verse 13. And it says this. So Moses cried out to the Lord, O God, I beg you, please heal her. What is this? Oh, this is empathy, which is key to diffusing racial tensions. And the incredible thing is that Moses is being empathetic to his sister who is racist right now. He's empathetic with her broken, fallen condition and her own blindness to her blindness because he's been there before. He prays for his enemy. Who does that remind you of? Jesus on the cross praying, oh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And Moses effectively is praying for his enemy. He's really empathetic. And this is such a powerful thing in diffusing racial tension. Can I just make a confession on behalf of Hometown Church's leadership? And I've got the senior leadership team's permission to say this and the teaching team's permission. We really missed an opportunity last summer to lead with empathy. When our cultural moment was so loaded with racial tension, racial tension, George Floyd was killed on a Monday. What we didn't do that following Sunday was devote the message and the, really the service to that cultural moment and giving empathy to those that really needed it. Who's that? Well, now I know because I've been listening better. People of color who that week and even since have been reliving their own experiences of the evil of racial prejudice. We could have given and should have given empathy to the authorities, to law enforcement authorities who were risking their lives to maintain law and order amidst the evil of mob riots. Mike Langlois and I, in that regard, both know police officers who for years have worked in the third precinct in Minneapolis that was burned down. Those officers experienced such hatred and malice, akin to what racial minorities and people of color have experienced in their moments when they're called racial epithets or when they're discriminated against. You get lumped into a group without any knowledge of your character and, and it's hateful and malicious and my friend who's a police officer in the third precinct, he was one of the last guys to get out before they burned it down. He said, you wouldn't believe the hatred. Shocked. 
We didn't give empathy to the authorities that were fighting tooth and nail to try to hold together law and order. We didn't give empathy, not enough, to our friends, to our community, people of color reliving their own experiences of racial prejudice. And <clears throat> how about the minor minority, mostly minority business owners who lost everything when their retail shops were destroyed, when they were looted, when they were burned to the ground. I apologize on behalf of our leadership team, on behalf of the teaching team. And I confess to you that that week as we discussed it, my vote was, no, let's go forward with the content we had planned. I was tone deaf. I missed it. We missed it. We're sorry. Because empathy is really key to diffusing racial tensions. But let's be comforted, even as we repent. In the end, God is going to do away with all racism without doing away with all of us. How could that be? Well, it's because of Jesus. Jesus took on himself the penalty for all of our sin, racial injustice and every other kind. Hmm. This is a comfort. He's going to do away with all racism without doing away with all of us. We've got lots of work to do in the meantime. And may I ask you to remember and think about racism as a form of self-justification. A sinful way, and there's lots of sinful ways to try to feel superior, not just racial uh, prejudice. But this is one form of self-justification. A sinful way to feel superior, more acceptable, and better than others based on racial differences. And maybe you don't struggle with racism, and that's great. But don't you struggle with self-justification? And can't that give you a little more empathy for people where the bird of depravity of racism has flown over their head and they've let the bird nest in their hair for one reason or another? No good reason to do that, but some folks have. Couldn't we have empathy for them like Moses did for his sister? Because of our own going deeper in the gospel, a self-awareness, not a self-righteousness, apart from the mercy of God, I deserve wrath. Maybe that bird didn't nest in my hair, but others surely have, other birds of depravity. Can I ask you to consider a personal application? Repent. Whether you struggle with racist thoughts or whether you've been on the receiving end, of racial injustice. Can't we repent together of the sin at least of forgetting our gracious acceptance by God at the costly sacrifice of Christ? Because when we forget that, that that's our main identity, all sorts of other problems prop up. Perhaps like me, you'd benefit from listening to the personal stories of persons of color in your life. Maybe you don't have enough persons of color in your life to hear their stories. May I suggest, watch the videos that we're posting online from our racial advisory team. Every one of those persons of color have experienced some painful racist moments in their lives. And they're telling those stories with humility, with empathy, and with a desire for more justice, which is all good. And might you intentionally develop friendships with persons of different race, nationality, community, at least experience from yourself so that we can be more like God's love with skin on right where we live. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this delicate topic. Thank you for your addressing it. Thank you, Lord, for your wisdom, for your empathy. Lord Jesus, you entered our battlefield, fallen world earth, to rescue us, not just from the sin of racism, but from every sin and the ultimate consequence. Would you please help us to move, like Moses, toward more righteously self-aware? Thank you, Lord, for your promise to the meek Oh, you're going to inherit the whole earth. <laughs>
I look forward to that, Lord. And in the meantime, let's keep repenting. Amen. In your justice and your mercy, heaven walk the broken road. Here to fight the sinner's battle. Here to make my fall your own. Turn my eyes to see your face as all my fears surrender. Hold my heart within this grace. But in turns to wonder And I will fight to follow I will fight for love Throw my Try
this message really touched me. He showed me things from scripture that I'd never noticed before. And I especially liked how he defined humility as being a journey from being self-righteous to righteously self-aware. I also loved how he reminded us of the importance of empathy and how empathy is key in dissolving racial tension. You know, the economic impact of this pandemic has hit inner city and immigrant churches particularly hard. Many are in danger of closing their doors and are putting their pastors in very difficult situations. We would like to rally around some of these churches and support our brothers and sisters in Christ at this time through organizations like Be The Church Minnesota and possibly others. Be The Church and their One Fund campaign has been developed by Transform Minnesota and has the involvement of Pastor Andy Gray from our sister church, The Urban Refuge. You can learn about this organization at www.bethechurchmn.com. After I pray, I'd like to close the service with a video that highlights their One Fund campaign. Because of your generous contributions to our Kingdom Builders Fund, we have already donated $20,000 through the One Fund campaign to help churches in need. On behalf of Hometown Church, I just wanna say thank you for your generosity. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I wanna thank you, Father, for the, uh, for the wonderful word you gave Mark to share with us today. Uh, Lord, please use this church to begin healing racial tensions, Lord. Help us to learn empathy and understanding and help us to remember we are all united by faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.